Are we good? Yeah. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Noman and the Voice in the Hollow event. Yeah. Well, this is obviously super exciting. This is our first uh, public event since COVID. And so it's been a while. And uh, obviously, we're super excited to getting back to having people on campus and being able to uh, get back to what we used to do, which was doing this every month. But no cooler way to start off public events than with this, with Miguel and Tran and the Voice in the Hollow that they've been working very hard on uh, all year. Uh, I've known Miguel and Tran for a long time. I think it's 18 years VHS since VHS tapes. <laughs> it's been a long time. And uh, obviously, you know, seeing them progress as artists over the last, uh, you know, 18 years, 15 years has been amazing. Uh, they're such great people so talented, so inspiring, and amazing teachers who have taught so many students at Noman and a lot of people in the audience today. And so I'm just excited that they are here and honored that they're here and, and working with us and excited to see the short and everything they're gonna share tonight. So with all of that, a round of applause for Miguel and Tran. All right. Thank you, Alex. And Thank thanks you. everybody for coming. Uh, you know, we haven't left our house much in the past year, so uh, <laughs> yeah. we're pretty nervous about even being up here and showing you guys this, and we really appreciate every single one of you guys being here, so. Yes, Thank definitely. you. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, The Voice in the Hollow. Um, this was a project that we uh, started working on last year. The original idea for this was not to do a short, it was a story, it was a revenge story that we wanted to do, which was, the idea was basically, what if my mom, who's in the front row, mama, <laughs> what if my mom went on like a murder rampage to get revenge, and the, the character that she was getting revenge uh, for was a Colombian artist, a, a woman though, that had done a comic book called The Voice in the Hollow. And they were supposed to interplay between the live action story and this. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that didn't happen, but we ended up doing this thing and uh, it's pretty fucked up and we hope you like it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I guess we, let's just start with some of the stuff. So this is just some of the stuff we've done through the years. Um, Sorry about that. So, okay. 
So all that stuff was, was all stuff that we did on our own uh, other shorts. And uh, all of that stuff was done mostly with V-Ray, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, a few years ago, we were invited um, by Brian to be part of the Unreal Fellowship Program. And uh, we had never used Unreal uh, before. And we had four weeks to um, basically learn this program and make a short with it. And we really quickly fell in love with it. And we did this little short, um, what was it called again? <laughs> Vision Quest. Vision Quest, yes. So, yes, for the fellowship, uh, we actually worked together yeah. on one project, which Brian allowed. I'm very thankful for that, because that set up the work that we're going to show tonight. Yeah. Uh, but this was the precursor for it. Yeah, so we did all of this. is just a little snippet of it, but we did all this stuff in like three weeks, which was like building all the sets and trying to modify some of the characters. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that was just a small section. We actually did, I think it was like two minutes long, but that was just a little part of it. And we really quickly fell in love with, uh, with this whole thing with Unreal, just the, the amount of iterations we could do, even in a three-week process, which would have been impossible to do uh, otherwise. Um, and when Alex asked us to come in and work on this other, to, to, uh, something new, um, that's when the voice in the hollow came in, and this is a 10 months. So, you know, I'm just going to play it and uh, I'll let you guys see it. So, we could dim the lights, and um, I guess I'm, if we could trigger the, the, the restream video, um, I'll do it right now. So, um,
huyu anataka nini tena? Eh, mkuki wake. Tena? Koa, hebu twende. Ala mwanangu, kazi nzuri sana. Wazee wakiona hii watafurahi sana. Baba. Mwanangu, nafikiri sasa uko tayari kwa chui. Baba. Wawindaji zuku pekee ndio watakaozaliwa upya kama juu. Na wale tu wanaokaa na thamani ndio watakaovaa marakoa. Kutenganisha walio na nguvu kutoka kwa wahafifu. Kuvuka katikati ya miyale wawindaji wa kike. Baba Umemona kwa ameenda wapi? Mimi sio mlinzi wa dadangu. Si wende ukamtafute sasa. Na mawindo je? Ataungana pamoja na sisi. Bona! Yeye si chui. Kamwe usifurahie madhaifu ya dada yako. Menisikia, sitakwambia tena. Sawa. Unazeni unaniogopesha? Baba angalia sasa nitakachokifanya.
We told you it was fucked up. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's not for kids. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm so nervous. My, my hands are so sweaty. They're super, I, super sweaty. Yeah. yeah, when I started playing, I just got so nervous. <laughs> so yeah, so that's uh, that's our beautiful animated kids film, and uh, let's just go through uh, the inspiration for this. So when we were shooting the Nino, there was this cave that we shot some stuff in up in North California called the Moaning Cave Cavern, and it looked similar to the the image in the bottom left, except it didn't have graffiti, and. This little hole was on the top of a hill that was like eight feet tall. And people would, would uh, say that they could hear the, the moans of a little girl crying from inside this hole. And when we were down there shooting, they actually said, oh, don't shoot over in that area over there because that's where all the skeletons are. And we're like, what skeletons? So apparently through the years, people would keep coming up to this hole to try to find who this little moaning this, the moans were coming from, and they would fall, and they would just think that because it was on an eight-foot hill, that she probably fell eight feet or six feet or whatever, and it was actually a 250-foot drop to the bottom. What's crazy is when they got to the bottom of the, the pile of bodies, because they were all still there, there was a skeleton of a young little girl. So I... I'm, I don't believe in superstitious stuff, but I was like, what the hell are the chances that everyone <laughs> is hearing a little girl and the bottommost skeleton was a little girl? So there wasn't much I could do with that except the story of one person keeps falling one after the other after the other. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. But I was like, what was the first story? How did the first girl end up there? So we were very inspired by Cain and Abel. Right, just a basic story of the bro two brothers, the rivalry between the two brothers, and I believe that Abel was probably an asshole. Right, <laughs> he was probably an arrogant little bitch, and Cain was like, "Shut the hell up!" Probably threw the rock by accident and probably killed him. Then he's like, "Okay, we gotta get rid of the body somehow." So that was basically the basic idea. So. The way I saw it was the whole represented Lucifer and the father represented God. And they were both trying to get the attention of the father of the tribe. And the mask represented, you know, like a favoritism, a, a, a acceptance into the, the party. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so when we started coming up with, like, okay, how are we going to tell this story? These were like the big inspirations were in particular like Westerns. And I know that when you look at this, you might not see the Western stuff, but there's definitely like the standoff. The Great Silence in particular, the Sergio Corbucci movie was a big inspiration for me because the ending was so freaking bleak that I was like, oh my God, you could do that? Like you could end it that fucked up? And I was like, okay, we got it totally. <laughs> uh, the, the movie Framed, uh, another one I think from 75, there was, a, it's not a great movie, but there is a scene where this guy chokes out, chokes a cop that was so brutal and what's so beautiful about movies from the 70s is 
that people look sweatier and uglier. And there was just something so awesome about that. So Framed was a big thing. And then Tales from the Crypt, of course, like the, the morality tale of it, like the EC Comics, Black Sabbath, again, was a huge influence on that, the Mario Bava film. And Apocalypto, obviously, because of the tribes and all that stuff. So you could see like the similarities with something like this, like the standoff and the good, the bad, and the ugly, the, the type of, even the typography against the red, this all comes from Westerns. Uh, and you could see like the similarities between this and that. Like it might not be obvious, but they're definitely there for me. Even stuff like the fonts and the way the, the wording was put in, like color by deluxe, you know, the, the copyright, the yellow, that's something that we, we really wanted, of course, it was color provided by Unreal Engine, so. Uh, uh, but yeah, so you can see, we're trying to put all that, those things in there, like this could feel like it belongs in a Western from that, that time period. Another huge influence was like Mario Bava, who then influenced Dario Argento in terms of his color palette, in particular for the, possess, the possession scene. So you could see something like this and something like this is a direct uh, in, in, uh, influence, so. Yeah, Mario Bava, if you guys don't know, basically every movie you love came from, like genre stuff, came from Mario Bava. All the stuff that we like, everyone ripped off from this guy. So he's amazing. Um, so yeah, so some of that stuff. So character designs. One of the real tough things is, what the hell is any of this stuff going to look like? Um, and Tran, do you want to like talk a little bit about this stuff? No, you can... <laughs> I mean, I didn't really know. I had no, I think I, when, when we started this, we just had the script. I had no idea what anything looked like visually, which is not how we normally start. I always kind of start from the visual. We just had the story. And yeah. so it was just pulling in all these different things together. And it felt like uh, a crazy mixing pot. Like, how is this Western? How is this going to come together? How are these colors yeah. going to work? Well, the tough thing yeah. is there's no... African fantasy films besides Black Panther. That's it, right? There just isn't. So when you're looking for reference, if you're like, oh, let's do a Victorian thing like the Nino, all right, there's 100 years worth of cinema that you could pull from, stuff that's so old that it wasn't Victorian, basically, right? So when it comes to this, you're like, what, does, what do we use for reference? Because what we didn't want is for this to feel like, you know, The Lion King or something like that. We wanted this to feel a little bit more fantastical. Um, but these are some of the things that we found that we were like, okay, this aesthetic for the hair pieces in particular, we thought were amazing. Like she kind of looks like the, the arrogant one kind of looks like a ram. Uh, and the other one is much more, uh, Koa is much more meek and- um, She's more like a sheep. Yeah. So body paint was a big thing. So. This, none of this came from one particular tribe. It was from mishmash of uh, a bunch of different ones. And these are just like early developments. Oh, these are hard to show. Yeah. Uh, this is this is stuff I was doing, and you can tell I had no idea what I was trying to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, from this, I'm like, this is what we don't want it to look like. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is another thing that we really wanted to do because we had a time constraint because there was pretty much two of us doing the day-to-day -day stuff, even though we had some help from some people that are even here today, which were great. We, we knew that we didn't want to do anything that was photorealistic. We wanted everything to feel like a doll that was carved out of wood. We didn't want people to go, oh, your eyes don't look realistic. We know. It doesn't matter. By making them look like wood, no one is going to say that the refraction is not correct, right? The refraction of the, of the iris is not correct. So uh, we intentionally wanted a style that, that felt much more stylized and more like a puppet. That's also why we use the very shallow depth of field to make things feel a little bit smaller. Yeah, and right around this one was kind of like, okay, it's, it obviously wasn't the final result, but that's when it kind of looked like some kind of stylistically style. yeah and it this whole process was not a, a com and i talked about it on the stream it wasn't very comfortable for me because i'm very used to working in film and just going more with realism and uh it's probably the first stylized piece i've done yeah so yeah it actually is <laughs> it, it's funny that when we finally nailed the look it's the whitest thing in the world right like this totally doesn't look like the final characters but the style, like the language was kind of starting to creep in there. So this is our main girl, which is Koa. 
Yeah, and hopefully maybe you can see, I was trying to make the hair feel more like a sheep. <laughs> and you can see the, the facets and everything, again, making everything feel like a piece of wood that was carved. And painted on top. Yeah. By, so it's also very, a lot of hand painting, which is something I don't always do um, on something photo real because you don't really, you want to try to hide your strokes, right? And here is I'm trying to show my paint strokes. Yeah. So like when you look at the eyes, you can see like there's like cracking paint on the whites of the eye, again, to make it seem like it was a, a folk doll that you could buy. Um, and then some of the clothing. Yeah. And there's a lot of like design, well, when you get to the next one. Yeah. So Ala, um, she started off much more symmetrical, but we wanted to make sure that there was a, a, a difference between the two of them. So one of them is clearly the better hunter of the two. So this one wasn't working because I just felt like, well, if they're both wearing the same kind of thing, then they're, they're kind of equal. But Ala, since she's the hunter, the better one of the two, she should be wearing all these pelts and, and leathers on her body, which were all the kills she's done before. Yeah, so we try to tell a story where if you actually look carefully at Koa's clothing, she doesn't have any animal skin because she hasn't been very successful. Whereas... Uh, Alice's design is asymmetrical. It's a little bit it's supposed to be more free. And you can see everything she has is, is actually a skin yeah. um, that she's hunted down and she has more body paint. And she's, she's got like the badass fangs and what, you know, but. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, by the way, that we'll talk a little bit about later, but that we really struggled with um, with Koa is this red paint look different on every single shot. So uh, <laughs> it was kind of like that meme with the blue dress. Yes, it was totally like that. And I, I think uh, I was going crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so the shaman, um, one of my, my favorite characters on this, just looks so cool. And yeah, so that's inspired from the, these The things. mask is like really huge. Uh, yeah. It's. It's much larger. I don't know. I guess you were like, well, he's bigger figure, so his mass is bigger. Or yeah. something. Very simple thinking. Simple thinking is how we roll. <laughs> yeah. So this is just showing some of them. And again, you can see everything is like carved wood. So Baba went through a big development. So you can see he's kind of looks angry in like the third one and then on the fourth when he finally had that look. Because we, the, the father is supposed to be a guy that basically, like most men, have no idea what is going on, right? And he has no idea that there's a rivalry happening between the sisters until he sees the one sister storming out. And then he's like, oh, shit, I better do something. And at that point, what we really wanted with the story is at any point, any one of these characters could have prevented this, right? If the father would have just gone in and seen that treatment, like, oh, shit, we probably shouldn't come here, right? Allah could have just gone and said, hey, dad wants you to come on the hunt. Koa would have been so happy and she would have gone. So this could have all been prevented. So the father, we wanted to look that you kind of felt, I don't know, what, what am I trying to say here? Well, that he was just a, a likable guy, but also kind of Yeah, aloof. I mean, the when we wrote this script, I mean, if you notice, he doesn't have a ton of lines. So we were trying to, in the way he looked, try to represent his feeling and we didn't want him to be angry. We yeah. wanted him to feel kind and maybe just not aware of what's going on. And then you can see like the third one, you know, if he had looked like that, how would you have felt um, about this character? He would have looked more angry. Yeah. So just, he's more like a presence. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, um, I really loved how he looks. And it, it's a, it's, a, it's a shame that he's basically wearing a mask the majority of the time, but the mask was such an important element because that was, you know, the MacGuffin. That's what they're after. She wants that mask. Not the mask itself, but what the mask represented. So just some more um, angles of them. I love this guy. I, I would love to 3D print these guys and have them in my house. So... So, okay, so extra. So we have, this was kind of funny because the, there was a ton of extras done and then we realized they all have to wear masks so they all kind of look, can't even fucking tell. <laughs> so you never see like the face. <laughs> they all just have like a body and yeah. a mask. 
So, and there was actually a few more, but these were developed in a way so we could get infinite variations with the body paint colors. So by creating masks, you could go in, change the clothing color, change the paint color uh, on any of them. Yeah, it was a very flexible system in order to get variation. Um, really nice material system that you can build in Unreal. All we would have to do, you can see here, is swap out black and white masks, and you would have a ton of variation, and you can choose any paint color you want, um, and then changing the skin tones and the saturation level. Yeah, so. Same thing with the skirt. Um, when you're just small, <laughs> you need as much, like, Flexibility. Flexibility as possible. So the clothing here was made in a way with just a, a series of masks. Um, and you can color and tint like a bunch of various sections. So you can see here what we're trying to do is, what I'm trying to, we're trying to show is how much variation you can get in these patterns. That way they never look quite exactly the same. Yeah. So the anteater, so Ricardo, who was one of the no student, Nomen students, uh, when we were doing the live stream, every time the anteater would show up or we would show that he's dying, Ricardo would comment on it. So like, we got to, this guy really cares about the anteater. We should just call him Ricardo. So the anteater <laughs> became Ricardo. So that's his official name. And this was kind of a funny choice. Like, uh, it's metallic and he has clothing. <laughs> it's a wild animal that, that has pajamas on. And That's the cool thing about not having any reference, like anything that compares it. We're like, I guess he would wear pajamas. And I guess, <laughs> and I guess it's blue. Yeah, I guess Why it's not? blue. So I really like this guy. And, uh, and it is actually based on like the patterning on, on the real anteater. On a real anteater, yeah. yeah. So this is like, these were the first two renders that we got. Um, we were so happy when we got these, and you can see there's no face stuff at this point, but when we were just seeing them breathing and we were seeing them render, we were like, oh my God, this is all gonna work. This was a huge moment for us, even though now we look at it and we, we just see the lifelessness in the face, but for us at this point it was, wow, this is, this is awesome. And we were doing this with the early access version of Unreal, so. Um, yeah, Unreal was very, new to us. I mean, we had done the fellowship. Just but we had four weeks of experience plus yeah. whatever but it took us to get to. The fellowship was version four. And then version, version five felt so different, especially if you don't, you know, I didn't know Unreal very well. So yeah, this, yeah. yeah. Well, after this, the, the fellowship, we kind of didn't use it that much because we were doing other, we were writing the script. Yes. Yeah. And so we forgot some of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, we forgot a lot of it, actually. Yeah. So, okay, so the leopard mask. So the leopard mask is obviously one of the most important things in the film because that is what she's after, right? Again, it's not the mask itself, but what the mask represented. Um, the tough thing with it is the masks are kind of goofy looking. They're beautiful, but in a, in a kind of goofy way. And um, this was like the first like paint over that I did where I was like, this is what I want the logo to look like. So I just grabbed the mask, warped it so it looked a little bit more cool put the blood on the face, now you know what the blood represents, and then the, you know, the writing in the bottom, but like that is the shirt you guys all have for, for the most part. Um, so this is just like early uh, stages of coming up with uh, the look of this. And these were drawn by a guy we always use called Zol1369, that's his, that's his name. And he's an awesome guy, he's, uh, he's Fantastic super, artist. Yeah, he's an amazing artist. He's really mad at us at the moment, but, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's okay. And uh, he did this beautiful uh, logo that you guys are all wearing. So you could see this is just like the early developments of it. So at a certain point, we were, we were worried about the fact that, hey, you're not going to see the mouths moving. But we, we, were, we were actually fine with it. But so, yeah. And this is the final logo, of course, which is the tree, the snake, which represents envy, uh, the blood, of course, on the face, and the, the voice in the hollow. So this is uh, the father's mask and Allah's mask. And Allah's mask is based on the logo. So the logo was designed before the actual uh, 3D mask. Yes. 
These are like the extras. So the village. So these are early drawings um, that I did to try to see like what the language would be. So originally, I liked the idea. I saw that there, there, there was a tribe in Africa that kind of had these roofs, so you can see on the right-hand side, and they would just kind of all come together or separate, and it would create a barrier around the entire um, village. The problem is you, we couldn't get uh, very cool angles with this. It was just kind of the top view, and then like you're in the middle or you're from above. And, and they're not very large. They're, they're not very large. Yeah, yeah. they tend to be quite small. But you can see the shapes on the, on the, on the left. They're all very basic, but that's basically what we ended up going with. So these are all, we had to build this entire village. Even though you see the village in essentially one shot, we had to build everything. So every tent was designed. Um, Some of these we didn't, like this one here, I actually really like this one. Um, but we didn't use it because we were still in early access and we couldn't render uh, some of the foliage. Well, yeah, like the little straw would just flicker. It would just flicker so like crazy. So we made them, or Miguel actually made this, and I like it a lot, but we didn't. it's not in there. <laughs> there I think this is all X-Gen, right? Yeah, it was all X-Gen. I like how I did it, and I'm asking you how I did it. Cause <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you actually did it. Uh, so, yeah, just more. And, yeah, so these, some of them came back in. Yeah. This one was a little Polynesian. For Ken. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is. Uh, and some of these here, we we stripped out the the straw, and they didn't have issues. Now they work totally fine. <laughs> right? Yeah, they're in there. They're just in the background. They're like a pixel in size. Some of these things, and they took a while to to build some of these things. Yeah. So we uh, basically assembled. Some of it was from scratch, and then some of it was from. Mega scan assets. So we use their scan assets of as branches, branches as Lego blocks, basically, to help us construct. And whatever uh, we need to have to customize, we had to make ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely having all those nice assets was very helpful in, in increasing their speed. Yeah, and it shows you that just because you're using Mega Scan assets, it doesn't have to look like Mega Scan assets. Like we're just we figured, hey, these are just wood planks and branches. This is how they would build it anyway. So you could see a ton of tents, and it's in one shot. So the, all this stuff was built very modular so that we could make even more variations of, of uh, the tents or the stairways or whatever. So you can see modular uh, stairs, modular. This is for the ceremony. Yes. Yeah. I think that drum was a Japanese drum that we had to grab and retrofit it to feel like it was a, an African drum. So you can see these are all modular pieces so that we could build bridges, um, windmills, whatever. So the beach. So this is how it started. Um, and the way we kind of work is I'll, I'll start something and then I just get tired of it and I give it to Tran and she makes it better. <laughs> Right. Well, it works out great because, um, honestly, I think Miguel had a clear vision for this. I was like, what am I doing <laughs> this whole time? And I, I think by him starting, starting it, I go, oh, I see. Uh, and then we get two minds onto it, and it, the result is just something different. Yeah. Um, so we get something like this. We kind of we like this look a lot, but we were like, okay, we got to put more complexity to it. So again, references for the type of, of uh, boats. And uh, this was the base one. So this was all done. Um, I think it's like a mud box. And again, like mega scan branches, latticed to make um, other shapes. And then the, the individual sails. But you can see it's basically all Lego blocks. That is still the same yes. single canoe. And now the mega scan stuff on top of it to give it this complexity. And we basically use... Uh, the boats kind of as set pieces um, that you can move around. I mean, it was kind of a nice thing because you can't really move buildings, big buildings around. Um, wanted to, we wanted to make sure that we could see the logo in red uh, in it. Yeah. Because red's a, a very important color. So, yeah, so you can see, like, at the end, we start putting the canoes everywhere. Um, and that's all, like, mega-scanned ground, which was really cool. So, okay, so the Morning Star. So like we said, the Morning Star, this is, um, represents like the devil. That's what we wanted the tree to be, hence like the horns and everything. 
Um, even the logo, when you see it, um, it's got a lot of the symbolism from, so the right hand side here, this was a, this was a, a court document used to burn a priest in the stake because the devil, he had made a deal with the devil and this was the devil's only proven, proven, and I say that with air quotes, his signature. And that's in the logo. So when you see the, the, the sparkles in the logo and the poster that you guys all have, it's got the devil's signature in it. Uh, <laughs> so you guys are all going to hell for hanging that in your wall. <laughs> right. so, yes. uh, so now it's pretty obvious that this poor guy was framed and he really didn't sign the deal with the devil, but they used it as an excuse to burn the guy. So, but, so this was like the development of, of this thing. So that was the very first sketch that I did of what I wanted this thing to look like. And then we brought this into Gaia and start developing what this, uh, this hole, the hollow, would look like. So we knew it couldn't just look like the hole from the Moaning Cavern because it's not cinematic looking. So we needed it to look really evil, obviously, because those that know that I'm a Star Wars nerd, it has to look like the Sarlacc pit a little bit. <laughs> Uh, so that was definitely an inspiration and, uh, Gaia was great. This is the first, like this, the closer drawing to it. And then I just brought that into Mudbox and just kind of traced it to get the look of the tree. Um, and, and that's it. So it's like the Gaia mega scans and, uh, and Mudbox. Yeah. yeah. So ceremony. Uh, this was the very first sketch of the ceremony. <laughs> but you see, it's all there, right? Like, you got the, yeah. the leopard there, the fire. So I see this, and I'm like, Tran, this is what it's got to look like. She's like, what the hell is this crap? <laughs> but to me, it's, it makes total sense. So uh, it's all there. You see the fire on the sides. And the, and the leopard statue. <laughs> the leopard statue, yeah. In the center. So that's it. Look, it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this was... Uh, I really wanted this this piece to look really cool. And originally in the script, it was like a small little fire, like a small a, little tribe. I think my mic went out. Oh, it's doing no, it's there. It was a campfire. So it just had one flame. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you know, now that we had, you know, the, the ability to do it, we're like, okay, this thing's gotta be freaking awesome. So. Uh, it was an opportunity to show in the story a little bit the world and environment that they, these characters live in. Yeah, and make it, again, like a fantasy African story. We wanted you to see them and be like, oh, my God, this is like a really developed tribe that's got this awesome stuff. There's people everywhere here, and there's dozens and dozens of, of uh, crowds in there, and they're all Alembic files. So this, this, this scene was a monstrosity to open, but they're every, you could barely see them, but they're everywhere. There's people um, just hanging out. So... This was another tough one because we're like, okay, we got to make this really badass looking leopard. So let's look at reference. And then you can see it looks like the happiest freaking leopard in the world. Like he looks like the owner just came home with a treat. And we're like, it can't look like that. He's got to look like this awesome leopard. So Tran made this beautiful thing. Thank you. Yeah. And we, you know, we still kept the bib, but... <laughs> but it's pretty awesome. And you can see it's got like the circular patterns which represent the spots of the leopard. Yeah, it's very interesting studying all, all these different things and going, wow, um, I like it, it's cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. And these are some of the statues inside, which you don't see them very well. But you feel them, and I, I think that's something that's very important. And those that, that have taken my classes, that's something that you always hear me saying. It's like it doesn't matter if you see it, you have to feel it. So it doesn't matter if it's all in the darkness. As long as you feel that there's complexity there, that's really all that matters. And this is just some of the... Modular pieces. Yeah. So we're able to work very, very much in Lego blocks. Mm -hmm. And then you can see here, assembled together, all those... <laughs> you feel it? <laughs> yeah. All those few pieces coming together. It looks much bigger. But look, even in the shadow, like you it's, you freaking feel it. There's stuff there. Yeah. And you can see the altar pieces. And this is a full 360 set. So you could really look at this from any angle. Uh, so a lot of them are not fully 360, but this one is fully built out. 
So I would love to do like the VR goggles and just look at the sec. Yeah, awesome. I like Awesome, yeah. But you can see there's people up on the top, on the scaffolding, it's pretty cool. So, and these are some of the other modular pieces for that. So you can see just a ton of, uh, of um, work put into all of this stuff. And then we used uh, the material system inside a substance painter, which made everything really fast. So I'm just uh, showing here how you can apply a smart material. So it's literally just making one slapping on top and you're done. <laughs> right? it, yeah, it it's, would literally look at all the, the, I guess the normal maps, all the curvature maps, and then give you this beautiful texture. Uh, and this is a breakdown of material. So start with bronze, desaturated it, gave it variation, added some oxidation. And just some of the layering and the oxidization. An additional layer. And then, yeah. ta-da! <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the cast. So, okay, so this was a tough thing. Um, when we first started this, we're, we thought, oh, this is, we're going to cast this in L.A. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look, the script was written in English, but we're like, we'll, we'll try to find some Swahili actors in L.A. And we got hundreds of submissions, and none of them spoke, none of them spoke Swahili. <laughs> so we're like, shit, this you know, the reason why we picked Swahili in particular is because it was the most common used language in Africa. So I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. And it was not easy. So we considered doing this all in English, and we had some uh, actresses read for it in English, and it just felt so wrong. Not, not in, just, it just didn't feel real. There was something about it that I just hated. I'm like, we have to do this in Swahili. And uh, we decided that we're going to, go look in Africa to find the actors. And we we couldn't, we, so we, we started hitting all the talent agencies, which there isn't any, in Africa. <laughs> and we're like, can we, help, can we find actors in Africa? And nothing. So then I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look for audiobook translators. So once I thought about that, we found a few actresses that, translated audiobooks from English to Swahili. They, were, they, they didn't consider themselves actors or actresses. So I was like, I'm going to record them until they break. And we're going to get a, from a thousand. They'll, they'll say the same thing a thousand times. And we'll find one good version of everything. And they were actually fantastic. They, they didn't require as, as uh, much uh, work. Yeah, I didn't have to break them. They were actually amazing. So hi. My name is Janet, I am from Tanzania, and I am playing the part of Koa. Nasemane ni ngeweza? Nasemane ni ngeweza? Nyonyeshe! Hebu nyonyeshe. Hi, my name is Rosalie, I'm from Kenya, and I'm playing the part of Allah. Sasa hivi! Sasa hivi! Jome! Sasa hivi! Ningetaka kukuchoma, ninge kuchoma. Lazima twende. Hello, my name is Gudla Gabriel. I'm Best from name ever. And in this story, I played the role of the father. Hope you enjoy it. Usifurahie madhaifu ya dada yako. Sita kwambia tena. Kamwe usifurahie madhaifu ya dada yako. Menisikia, sita kwambia tena. Yeah, so he, they were all amazing and... Good luck, Gabriel. I was like, so what? Do you really want me to put a good luck, Gabriel, on the on the credits? He's like, yeah, that's my name. I was like, okay, good luck, Gabriel. It is. So it's awesome. It's, he's awesome. He's yeah. amazing, and the, so all three of them were amazing, and uh, we're super lucky to have to have found them. Okay, so so okay, so because this was recorded in in Africa, when we wanted to, when we came to to the motion capture. It was impossible for me to go to Africa, and it was impossible to, to bring all three actors from Africa here. So we started working with a really good friend, Caitlin. Who we and, worked with in the past. Yeah. Uh, she was in the Green Ruby Pumpkin. She was 13 at the time, or 10. <laughs> she was the little bride of Frankenstein and Mary. Um, and we recorded all the motion capture, most of it here. So Hi. You can see. Okay, so hold, finger straight. Move around. around.
So that's Caitlin and Mary. They're over here somewhere. Where are you guys? There you are. <laughs> yeah. So they, they were great. So initially I thought, well, you know, I have the mocap suit. I could just mocap myself. <laughs> and I, I started recording myself playing the girls. And I was like, God, that looks like a 40-year-old dude, right? <laughs> And I was like, you know what, I got to move my hips more. And I started, like, moving my hips around. And it was so obvious that it was a 40-year-old dude, like, waving his hips around. I was like, this looks terrifying. And then <laughs> when we brought them in, they, like, completely, they like, I kept them. seeing how, like, they would kick. And I'm like, I can't kick like that. Like, look how high that leg was. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was the best thing we ever did. So thank you, girls. So, yeah. Um, the face. The faces were all done using the, this program called Mocap X. So our good friend Chris Bosjatnik, who couldn't make it today, did the 52 blend shapes. And this was all uh, being driven with one of this, um, I forget the name of the company that built the helmet, but we just put an iPhone and it would record the face and it would transfer it onto. So this is not a one-to-one. -one, um, example here, but you can see everything is being driven by a camera recording uh, everything. So everything that is speaking was me. So every time that the characters are speaking Swahili, since our actresses were in Africa, I had to memorize all the dialogue in Swahili, get the timing exactly right, and start screaming Swahili at the top of my lungs. And try to, so every time you see you see the, this movie and they're screaming or they're crying or whatever, that's it's actually me. Miguel. So I, and, and I was gonna put the video and I was like, I look so stupid, and and I'm wearing the helmet, my hair looks like a freaking crazy homeless guy. So I'm like, all right, I'm not putting this thing. I don't care. So, but yeah. So this is. This is when we did uh, reshoots. So you can see, since the mocap and the facial mocap are from two completely different programs, uh, we had to blink and clap so that we could synchronize the movements. That became like our clapper board for animation. It was a way to sync it, because otherwise it, yeah. there was no way to know... To know when it started. The face would line up with the body. With the body, or, yeah. 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 All right, so lighting. So this is just some breakdowns. So those are those weird things are light blockers. <laughs> to cast shadows, yeah. yeah. And that was a backdrop for the sky. And it's just reassembling the lighting and see how it comes together. But when you look outside, it looks it's pretty ugly. <laughs> but it works. Yeah. And every shot had to be relit almost like a hero like a from scratch almost. Yeah. So that was the raw lighting and then reassembling the lighting. Yeah. Um, this is just showing like the intro pass. So this is like Gaia and you could just see like the modular pieces of the trees, of course, and then the modular stuff that we showed you for the village. At this point, we were able to turn shots around really fast. Um, this was the last shot that we did from scratch and it came easier. But the beginning yeah. was very hard. Yeah. Yeah. And here's just a layer breakdown. So this is just showing how many versions we did of every shot. This one probably had the most versions. And so and this one we actually have more versions of what we showed here, but it just started getting boring. But you could just see the amount of iterations that we did and the amount of time that this uh, went. So you 
because he's horrible. <laughs> I bet he looks terrible. It got worse. <laughs> This one went through drastic changes. This is the exact same shot, just now that angle doesn't work, it has to be from here. Like, no. This is when she's supposed to see the hole. That changed a lot here. That felt pretty pretty at the end. Uh, okay, so VFX, Dakota, are you here somewhere? There you are. So, the, <laughs> so this was another uh, thing that we had to figure out was getting Houdini uh, elements into Unreal, um, which was something we had never done, so it was difficult for us, but it looks pretty freaking cool. So originally, we went pretty heavy on the blood, and I was like, all right, this is a little too much. Because I, I originally, I was like, okay, I do want it to be super violent. Again, like 60, 70 cinema. But I was like, if they kill this thing like this, everyone is going to hate both of the girls. Like, this is <laughs> way too much. It's a ton of blood. Plus, yeah. then you'd have, to, you'd have continuity problems. It, it shows up later in the ceremony. Do you want it to have blood everywhere? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But the way I see it is like to be a good storyteller, you have to be like the Old Testament God. You have to grab your characters, make them go through hell, make everything an obstacle in their life, and then at the end, kill them. So, <laughs> so this is where we ended up uh, with, with the blood. So it's pretty awesome still. You yeah. can see it's all dynamic, and it's, it's flowing on top of the pajamas, which is pretty cool. So music, Dan, yeah. where are you at? So, yeah, Dan is, if there's, if there's three amigos, Dan is our number three for sure. So every project we've ever done, the Green Ruby Pumpkin, the Nino, even like some of the ghost main stuff, everything, we've always done it with Dan. So he is literally like the most important guy in the equation. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I don't think our stuff would work without his music. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we love Dan, so... This is uh, some of Dan's amazing stuff here. He plays with a lollipop. Hey, <laughs> hey. <laughs> This is, a, I guess, a replica of an Aztec death whistle. And uh, it's supposed to sound like a bunch. I mean, they used it going into battle war, I guess, to sound uh, like a bunch of people screaming. So this is kind of what it sounds like. Um, yeah. And, uh, Very convinced. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, we've, I've known Dan since what, like since we were fifteen. We used to be in two punk bands together. <laughs> yeah, so. All right, so 2D animation. This was something that we added in the very last minute, but it was something that I thought was really important. So uh, here it goes.
Yeah, that's, that's so freaking cool. Um, uh, okay, so some of the challenges that we had. Um, the big thing was the fact that we had so much interaction with fabric. So everything was Alembic cached because we wanted all the clothing to be dynamic. The wind played a big part, of course, because the voice comes through as wind. And you can see the things just don't always work out. The cloth is exploding <laughs> as soon, <yeah. laughs> all over the place here. The vines poking through it. So this stuff is just kind of the invisible stuff that takes a lot of time. Yeah, this was really painful. So back to Ricardo here. <laughs> it looks fine, but the clothing fell off. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably why anteaters don't wear pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, and then we have, um, well, I think that's it. So, yeah, that's, that's basically, uh, that's everything we got. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you guys. So yeah, this is, uh, that's a lot of work. That's a year of work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna help uh, take some questions from the audience. Okay. So, oh yeah. Once I'm gonna start up the front here. Um, so uh, I'm sure we've got a gazillion questions for you guys. <laughs> okay. That was amazing. Thank you so um, much. So uh, yeah, I'm. This is a fantastic little board cube that has. A million tiny microphones inside, so I'm going to toss it to the people that have questions, and uh, I'll take some questions in this section in the front first. Anybody over here? Okay. Um, He's talking to the circle on the top. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have three. Go for um, it. What? Uh, why was there the decision to put like the film um, thing over the? The, the grain? Yes. So there's a few reasons for that. So we didn't... I, one of the things that I always tell my students is to make their CG look shittier. And what I mean that is like degrade it. Don't make everything look so sharp. Make, try to make things look more photographic. So I've always been a fan of like degrading the sharpness of it and making it blurrier. But on this one in particular, because the influences were... Um, these movies in particular, The Great Silence, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, all these movies from the 60s and 70s, the Grindhouse movies, they are very grainy. And I wanted to use that and also use, uh, again, to soften some of the CG sharpness that Unreal is great at. It does an amazing job of giving you super high fidelity, but we didn't want high fidelity. We wanted to pull it back and make it look a little bit more like something from the 60s or 70s. That's good. So, yeah. And... Um... Was there a feature idea, and are you going to submit this in film festivals? We're, we are going to submit it to film festivals, but I think on this project, one of the things, like the previous project we worked on, The Nino, we were so caught up in like turning it into a feature, doing this, doing that, turning it into something bigger. And on this one, we were like, you know, screw that. Let's just do everything that is uncommercial. Swahili, there's a few scenes that have nudity. It's completely horrible ending. Disney's not going to hire me when they see this. They're going to be like, <laughs> the hell is this guy horrible, right? They're going to put a restraining order against me. So, But we didn't care. I just wanted to do something for me, and this was it. So uh, would a feature be cool? I would love to do an anthology with this, a bunch of messed up little stories. And that that's maybe... An idea, but I think for this story of the leopard tribe, maybe it's something we could come back to. But I think this yeah. story is done unless there's a zombie sequel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, we've got one question in the back here. Hey, uh, hello. Um, hey, guys. Um, an actor coming from the cinema world that doesn't really know anything about animation, 
I just got to say, you guys do some amazingly detailed shit. Um, my question is, do you prefer indica or sativa? <laughs> uh, well, that's a question for Tran, because I don't do any of that stuff. But Tran? <laughs> you just call me out. My students think I'm very... <laughs> Uh, if I if I if I were to, I can't do either because I get too paranoid and then I start thinking, like, oh my god, I'm gonna die. So uh, I don't do that stuff. And I'm not saying that because my mom is in the front row. She probably does it more than me. <laughs> Another question? Yeah. So when you want to make a short film now that you've done both V Ray and Unreal, sorry, I'm over here. Yeah. Okay, there. Uh, when you want to do a short film now, you have both Unreal and V Ray under your belt. Does it become a matter of, hey, we want to make this film? Oh, this would make more sense for either engine, or what would you choose based on that? It's it's really hard to go back. Really um, hard to go back. It's. I think that if we had done this our traditional pipeline, it would have taken much longer. Um, the response time, the quality, just seeing everything instantly, it's so much faster. Like a lot of these shots. Um, in lighting, you could, you know, the shot, like the big wide shot, the, the title shot with the mountains, yeah. I think that would have taken weeks, weeks yeah. to do. And then with that shot, it was just like, Miguel spent, you spent like a few days, a couple of days building the Gaia. And then he passed it to me and I spent like maybe one or two days at that point. Um, yeah. And this was towards the end. So a day was like, we were like in a coma, basically. We were yeah. completely zonked out from working this, this much. Yeah. And it's just the speed time is, is, is insane. I still do like V-Ray a lot. I still love it. I still like how it looks. Um, but as, you know, a storytelling tool, it's, it's just hard. Yeah. And it, when, you know, we're just two people. I, d I don't think we would have tried to do this at all. Um, in a more traditional type of pipeline, because I don't think we would finish it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll see a couple hands here. Try to get by the speakers without uh, feedback. Start out here. Hi. Is it a coincidence that the names of the sisters together combined are koala? Or no. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. I hate koalas. No. <laughs> no. no, no there was Ko one. Koa is. And Allah's. Evil. Yeah, that was like when we were starting, it was just for us to keep track of the names, and then we just couldn't, we just couldn't think of them having a different name. But it was really like so we could be like when we were on this. There's a few things when you're writing a script, you want the names of the characters to be as short as possible so they take up less page space. That's actually a thing, right? So if you're making a movie with German characters, you're screwed, right? Yeah. But so Ko and Ala were super short names, and then we just kind of got stuck with those names, and we kept it. But we originally wanted to change the names. Yeah. yeah. We got another yeah. question right here. Tran, Miguel, fantastic to say the least. Thank you. Miguel, this question's for you. You at Nomen are notoriously the king of comp and post-processing. How is that pipeline different for you for this now that you're working in Unreal? Well, there, there's still, the thing about comp is comp is something that you're using because getting it fine-tuned takes too long inside of V-Ray, right? But the principles were still applied here. You just could do it in real time in Unreal. You didn't need that extra step. But all the, the same principles were there. If you could get it fine-tuned and perfect in, in V-Ray, then I wouldn't be saying, oh, do it in Nuke, do it in Nuke, do it in Nuke. But uh, because yeah. you could do it instantly here, it was actually faster um, to just do it inside of Unreal. So we barely use any Nuke. I think the only times we used Nuke was to add birds in one shot and to add the Koa and Ala name next to them when you first introduced them. I think that's it. Yeah, but all the thought processes are, are very similar. Yeah. It's just we could see it instantly. Yeah. yeah. I think I would like to use Nuke more, but I still think that some of the passes are... I, there's a few passes that I wish were a little bit more like V-Ray, but again, we, we're, we're happy with how it turned out either way. Next yeah. question is right over here. Yeah. Oh, hi, Tran. Hi, Miguel. Thank you so much for sharing with us this incredible short film to all of us tonight. Um, my question is just really short and simple, but what was the place called where you got the inspiration for the hole, the chasm, that 200 foot? The Moaning Cave Cavern. The Moaning Cave Cavern. Yeah. You can visit it. It's and actually the skeletons are still there. Yeah. yeah. Really. Good. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Thank you. 
Take someone from this side over here. Okay. Where? There we go. Hello, Tran and Miguel. Hey. Um, so being students here at Noman, um, I was just curious, whenever it comes to like writing stories, um, we're kind of starting to, to build those ourselves and, and building this story from a, a background that's not yours personally. How do you kind of get confident enough to kind of share that with people that could be from a culture, cultural, cult, oh my goodness, culture similar to this and, and feel like you were able to execute it with grace and properly. Do you, do you mean like the fact that we were not writers originally? No, no. Like the, the background of these characters, like Swahili, like the African culture, like how were you able to kind of confidently share this culture with people not personally being from that culture yourself? Well, I feel like what we're just telling is, again, this is the Cain and Abel story. You could say the second oldest story, right? So ultimately all that matters is just that. It's the human experience. Everyone has felt uh, envy. Everyone has felt jealous. Uh, and that's all that we really cared about. Everything else we felt would fall into place if we just hit those basic human uh, flaws. So I, we, I don't think we ever thought about it past that. Yeah. Right. Like in terms of the cultural stuff, I, I, I don't ever like to think about that stuff. I just see humans, human flaws, human uh, qualities and apply that. And then the cards fall where they fall. There is no leopard tribe. There is no, you know, so as long as those human flaws and traits come in, that's all that really matters. I think that's universal. Yeah. Next question is right over here on this side. That was amazing. Um, Thank you. <laughs> going back to David's question, um, can you give examples of like how the compositing mindset translates into Unreal Engine, like a more real-time thing? Okay, well, I'm going to really nerd out here, but to me, the big thing is the black levels have to be, uh, the darkest values should always be closest to camera, and the lightest blacks need to be furthest away, and just making sure that if you just turn the image into black and white, you could always see a clear distinction of the silhouettes. The values need to gradually uh, lift as they go further into the distance. That's something that we're always thinking about, looking at stuff in black and white and making sure that the forms read in black and white. If the forms read in black and white, everything else falls into place. Yeah. Yeah. And that question is from the same area right here. Hello. Um, I love the look of the wood carved characters. I was just wondering if there were any other um, stylistic choices that you made to, you know, give that sort of stop motion puppet feel. We actually tried to push the stop motion thing a little bit further uh, where we were actually going to remove every other frame. The and problem without motion blur. And without motion blur. The problem is once we started adding like the chase sequence that we thought was so important, it just didn't feel like they were going fast and it just didn't feel right. The other thing is the camera on this one is a lot more dynamic than in like the Nino. The Nino, the camera is completely static, which by the way, the reason why the cameras are static on the Nino is because the render times were so long that we were like, okay, let's just lock it off. That way we don't just render one, one frame. Here, we were like, okay, we could render as many frames as we want, so let's make the camera move more. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I completely lost my train of thought. Yeah, what was the question? <laughs> what was the question again? I forgot. What was the question? Yeah, what was it? Can you repeat? We're tired. <laughs> oh, the stop motion, the stop okay. motion. So, well, yes. Well, okay, stop motion definitely inspired this. Um, and so did the limitations we had. Um, we don't, 52 blend shapes is actually very little for a character's face. And uh, you're, you're not gonna get a photo real human. So we already knew that was out and we didn't wanna do a photo, photo real humans. That's not what we're interested in. Um, I think we found that the look that we're trying to do is make it feel more like cinema or film rather than stop motion. And so that's why we went it's inspired by stop motion, but it became more, at least we, we tried to make it more cinematic yeah. um, and more based on like these, these references that Miguel has up here. Yeah. yeah. But again, all of that ties in like the stop motion look, the, the, the carved wood look, all of that is the, the grain, the blurriness of it is all to kind of 
not fight against the limitations of Unreal. And there's certain stuff like the stuff that Love Death Robots has done with um, with some of the, the Unreal projects that look completely photoreal and amazing. But with the resources that we had, there was no way we could compete with that. So we just um, went the opposite direction. Yeah, and we did render um, some shots without motion blur, and we decided we didn't like it. Yeah. That we love motion blur so much. Um, and that's always been in everything that we've done. So just even before this, you know, when it comes to rendering, like motion blur is going to fix this. It's going to blur it out. Yeah, motion blur. <laughs> that's uh, my, I love That's always my thought. Like, okay, let's just hide everything. If you also notice, um, a lot of our shots have lens flare. Usually that lens flare is to hide something that everything <laughs> looks kind of ugly. And whenever the feet would interpenetrate the floor, we'd be like, okay, we got to put a bush right in front. To... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Questions right over here. Hi. Um, sorry, this is weird. This is a weird cube. Um, <laughs> this was really, really incredible. This piece is really incredible. Um, but it stylistically is really different from what the two of you seem to have created before this. Um, it's a lot more stylized. My question is, um, I was in trans class when she was working on this, and she's mentioned how kind of strange it was to work on something this stylized. And my question is, are you, do you think in the future work you're going to be creating more stylized pieces or do you think I'm going back to realism? Uh, so that's something we're debating right now. I think we wanted to see um, the response to this. And we do want to do, th there is a, from a career point of view, and agents and producers and everything, there is still a prejudice towards animation, I think, where they're like, oh, cool, but it's a cartoon. Whereas if this were live action, I think there would be much more, um, it would be taken much more serious. So that would be the reason for us to go to live action. But what we love about this is the fact, like I wanted to tell like a Mexican pistolero story with the big sombreros, but do it with respect, not like a Cinco de Mayo drunken idiot kind of look, right? And I'm like, we could do this animated cast, all Mexican actors, and this would be fucking awesome. We could never do that live action. If we did something stylized, it would probably be a completely different style. Uh, well, not a completely different style in terms of the characters, but a completely different aesthetic. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was new, and I, you know, the thing is, I'm an insecure person. I don't ever feel good. Trent is awesome. I don't know why she's insecure. <laughs> I'm super insecure. I don't think anything I do is, is really there. So I felt uncomfortable. Um, but I did like the process a lot. Um, it was tough, but it, it felt very creative. So it's, it's hard. There's things I like about live action because that's all we've done. But there's things I like about this, but I don't feel quite comfortable. The endless possibilities with this is what's cool, that we could do anything with a budget. Whereas live action, you cannot. Yes, you need a lot of money. So if we wanted <laughs> to do anything, if you were like, let's do, you know, again, like the pistoleros, zombies, Martians, whatever, you could do it. In live action, it becomes much more difficult. But Yeah, it's much freer for storytelling to work like that. Yeah, I think jumping back and forth is what we ideally would want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Our next question is over on this side. Hi. Uh, thanks you, thank you guys again for your time tonight. And um, my question is, you guys are both instructors at this school and you both teach multiple classes and are very well renowned among your students. Um, how did you guys manage your time between both this personal project, this personal film and you know your students and your classes? <laughs> <laughs> well, we never left the house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we stayed home. We had no lot. life. We had no life. <laughs> We're the lamest two people in this entire room. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, students have a life like that too, right? They just sit in front of the computer all day. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to throw a question in really quickly. Uh, after having gone through this project, an Unreal Engine, do you guys have, you know, if you had a, a top two or three things that would be on your wish list? to be able to do an Unreal Net Engine next in terms of like features that you'd like to see added. Uh, is there anything on your minds with regards to that? Yes, uh, I think the uh, Alembic support, uh, I wish that we could bring in larger Alembic files. I think the Alembic streaming stuff is still not there. Whenever we tried doing that, it became really... Um, 
Unstable. Unstable. Uh, when we brought in files over 2.1, 2.4 gigs, the Alembic files would completely crap out and crash. That's really the, the main thing and the pivot. The pivot for Alembic files drove us crazy. Well, that was the main gr thing. Grouping too. Grouping, yeah. Yeah, trying to group things together and spin it around, all the pivots would just shift and then just kind of explode. And a lot of this stuff, by the way, might be things that there's a very e super simple solution, we just don't know how to do yes, it. Yes, there's also the fact that we don't know everything to be yeah. saying all this stuff. So we, we could be complaining and Brian could be like, dude, that's easy to fix, you idiot. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I think one more last thing is just uh, controlling your render layers more easily. Yes. Yeah. That that would help. Yeah, one but of then, the. But you know, that's so new too. Yeah, the know? thing that was was really weird about render layers is that you can render with layers, but when you did that, it would leave a black hole on the layer below, which kind of defeated the purpose because you would want the layer so that you could increase the depth of field and there would be a transparency to it. That you guys that have taken the look depth class know when we talk about depth of field, how something that goes completely out of focus basically becomes almost see through. But the minute it does that, you would have a black hole. So there was a workaround. You would just have to render it twice, once with it and once without it, cryptomatic, cut it out, whatever. But it was, it felt like there should just be a solution. One button, this is a layer, render it out separately. There's no cut out black hole there, and then you could defocus it in comp. Yeah, yeah. that was that's a big one. That's huge. Yeah. But again, there there's probably maybe a solution for that that we just don't know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We've got another question right here. Um, I was wondering kind of just how you mentioned like switching from like offline rendering to like Unreal type stuff. I was wondering like besides that kind of thing, if there's anything that you kind of had to pull your hair out or like for like, for example, like geometry like count, like did you have to worry a lot about that or was it kind of like a really free and fast process? No, it's actually the opposite. The yeah. geometry count in Unreal is insanity. Yeah, we easily have billions of polygons. So I do get sometimes students asking me like, Oh, since you're working on real, do you feel more limited? I'm like, no. Actually, the scenes are heavier than we've ever made it. Um, when we worked in our, our previous pipeline, the scene management was really, really critical. So every poly count was counted. You know, this was going to be proxy. The number of textures were counted. Um, everyone thinks like film is like limitless, but it's not. I actually felt much more limited working that way. And in Unreal, you're not even thinking about it. We easily have uh, 30 ton. million poly on geometry. Well, it's probably, it. it's probably a billion. Yeah. yeah. Each one mesh could have been 5 million and you have it 20 times around your scene. The other thing is also light counts. So we count our lights when we were working in Maya because each light contributes to the render time. So if we could, we would try to be like, let's have two lights. Third light is, oh no, we can't do that third light because it's increasing that render time. Here, easily in one scene, it could have 20 lights. Now, that probably won't perform well for a game, but it performs fantastic um, when you're trying to make a film, right? It's faster than anything we've ever done, and yeah. Yeah. I'm supposed to ask now. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, working at Epic, um, I've seen a ton of material come out of the engine and different... Um, you know, short films and projects and really beautiful pieces. So this is going to be the highest compliment I can give you. And that would be, this is one of the few, if not the only piece I've seen that makes me think, was this rendered in Unreal Engine? <laughs> Meaning awesome. it was, the production design was so strong and the lighting was so fabulous that I, you know, got lost in the piece and I'm really, really amazed by what you accomplished. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, is, that compliment yeah. means, <laughs> means the world. That's yeah. awesome. I think that means a lot because Brian works for Unreal and Epic. And so. he, was, he was our teacher. Yeah. He was our teacher the for fellowship. the fellowship. So. Yeah. so it's all his fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take just a couple more questions. We had uh, one right here first. Hi, uh, I was just wondering, because the process for making CG stuff takes such a long time, and after you get the script set, was there ever a part where you get 
an idea and you're like, well, what if we had like the devil at the bottom of the gorge? You're like, so yes. it would take a lot. Yeah. Yes. So Tran, Tran makes sure that I don't go crazy like that. Because <laughs> immediately I'm like, what about? And then she's like, no. <laughs> so a hundred percent, like that. I think I think I did actually want the devil at the bottom at some certain point. And I was like, no. <laughs> With that voice. Yes, yeah. exactly that voice. Nah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I was just wondering if after the last question we can see the film one more time. Yes. You want to see it again? Yeah. Okay. And okay. I, the, the next hand that I saw, and I have to do this all the time on live streams, but like in person, it's a lot more intimidating to cut off the questions, so don't kill me. Um, but i uh, got one more question right down here. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you so much. It's been an amazing story, and I love how... Hey. I, uh, <laughs> how Sonia. I am. That's me. <laughs> How like it's almost like a primal theme to it. So, do you have any other primal themes that re you really want to make into a story? Well, I think even th some of the themes from this are the same themes from the Ningyo, which is the deal with the devil, right? Ultimately, in the Ningyo, it's Marlo going to meet Celis in underground in this hole, right? It's the, basically he's going down to hell. Right, and he's meeting with the devil. He's making the deal with the devil. Now, I'm not a religious guy. And I'm not a Satanist. That I'm a mama's boy whose mom is in the front row, and I'm a pansy, right? So it's not that. But I just think that that theme of like selling your soul or, or having that that temptation is something we've all have. And the devil, not literally meaning a guy with horns, but you know, a, a drug addict fighting with drugs or this or that or whatever, right? I think that that's a theme that, that I, I always love. Yeah. I love the idea of like Robert Johnson be selling his soul to the devil to become the, the godfather of rock and roll, right? The, I think that those stories are incredible. I've always loved them. Um, yeah, it, and I, just as much, for some reason, Maybe it's because we're, we're artists, so the whole Robert Johnson story that you could sell your soul to become incredible. Um, I feel like we live that probably, yeah. <laughs> live that life just well, to the, sell our soul to make it. To, you're selling your souls to the art. The art is the devil. Yes. Right? You're, you're like, okay, there's our life. <laughs> there you go. Like we haven't left the house in a year, and that's, that was the, the, the deal. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's a theme that I think you'll, they say that a lot of filmmakers tell the same story over and over. And I think that that's something that you might see more of. And, and it won't be the same, but it'll be a variation of that. Yeah, I think that's, for us, a part of our journey. Yeah. Any other questions? Actually, I think we're going to roll it again, yeah? All right. All right.
Angalia! Kuna kitu kwenye shimo. Ndio haraka. Hivi huyu anataka nini tena? Mkuki wake. Tena? Koa, hebu twende. Ala mwanangu, kazi nzuri sana. Wazee wakiona hii watafurahi sana. Baba. Mwanangu, nafikiri sasa uko tayari kwa chui. Baba. Wawindaji zuku peke, diyo watakao zaliwa upia kama juu. Na wale tu wanaokawa na kamanya, diyo watakao vaha marangoa. Kutenganisha walio na nguvu, kutoka kwa wahafifu. Kufuka katikati ya miyale, kumendaji wa kike. Umemona kwa ameenda wapi? Mimi sio mlinzi wa dadangu. Si wende ukamtafute sasa. Na mawindo je? Ataungana pamoja na sisi. Bona! Yeye si chui. Kamwe usifurahie madhaifu ya dada yako. Menisikia, sita kuambia tena. Sawa! Unazani unaniogopesha? <gasps> Baba angalia sasa nitakachokifanya.
So we actually have a presentation uh, to make to you guys. This is, uh, I believe, Andrew from the uh, Modeling and Texturing Club he is going to be presenting something to uh, Miguel and Tran. Oh, nice. Presence. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, just wanted to thank you guys for all of your hard work. And uh, on behalf of the students here at Noman, uh, you guys gave us a bunch of posters and some cool shirts and stuff. So uh, we made you a poster of your own. Oh, awesome. Aww. So, that is a collection of work from all of your students oh, wow. over the last couple of terms. This is and amazing. And we turned it into a movie poster for you guys. That's so, awesome. we wanted to thank you by doing that. And uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you guys so and much. A bunch of messages <laughs> that we are going to read, but this is, in, this is incredible. Like, I recognize all these pieces. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. It's incredible. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. So yeah, the, well, I just want to say definitely a big thank you to Alex again. Uh, you know, this industry, not visual effects, but trying to get movies made and everything has been really heartbreaking. And Alex has always been like our biggest supporter for us uh, all the time. Yeah. So he, thank you, Alex. This thank is, you, Alex. This is always possible because of you. Only possible because of you. Thank you. So, yeah. And that's it. Before we uh, continue, I have a small thing to present. Uh, this was left outside. It's a small, I don't know what's inside. I'm not nosy, I didn't open it, uh, but we've got, I believe we've got it right here, so I'll send it back. Uh, as we conclude, I would like you guys in, to invite you guys to uh, finish, finish off any pizza or snacks that we have left. Um, <laughs> I, wow, there are Noman students here. And uh, I presume that Miguel and Tran will be around if you guys wanna chat with them. Uh, if anybody here would like to see the Noman campus, our digital labs, yeah. our libraries, and the spaces here, lost you can a, meet. Lost a yeah, band. And I'm obviously not inviting all the Noman yeah. students who have already seen it. But if you'd like to see the campus, uh, you can meet myself and my colleague Claire will be at the table out front where registration was happening. So thanks again, everybody, for coming.